Welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. Hey folks, just one thing before we get into the episode, and that is a word about our podcast sponsor this week, and that is Primadine, made by Oxford HealthSpan, which is the brainchild of my good friend, Leslie Kenny. Primadine is an incredible source of spermidine. Spermidine is one of the most incredible supplements that I have come across in a long time. It addresses six of the nine hallmarks of aging. And this particular spermidine product is incredible for a bunch of different reasons. One, it's super clean. There's nothing but spermidine and prebiotics that will support your body's own production of spermidine in the capsule. It is a high quality wheat germ extract. And what they've done to make sure that it doesn't go rancid and go bad is they've defatted it. They've removed all the fat, all those delicate omega-6 oils that can be good for you in certain contexts, but once they go rancid and they go rancid very quickly, it's anything but good for you. So Primadine addresses six of the nine hallmarks of aging folks. Everything from the proper folding of proteins to autophagy, to cellular communication, the proper um, DNA protection. Uh, uh, did I say autophagy? Anyway, six different hallmarks. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you can go look for a couple of posts I've written about spermidine and you will see why this is a supplement that I include in my stack every single day. And frankly, it is part of the foundation stack for every one of my clients. So if you decide you want to give primidine a try for yourself, you're going to want to go to primidine.com and use promo code BIONAT1515, and you will get 15% off your supplement. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with is that not only is Primadine doing all this incredible work under the hood to keep you healthy and rejuvenate your body and keep you youthful and vital, but on top of that, you're going to see it on the inside because you're going to grow stronger nails, better skin, and thicker, better hair. It is actually quite the most amazing thing. I've never really, I haven't seen too many supplements where I've gotten so much positive feedback from my clients and from my group followers. So by all means, if you haven't given this stuff a try yet, you must, uh, but you will know that it will take a good month or two before you start to see the effects and the benefits. So if you get, if, if this resonates for you, give it a shot. You won't be sorry. And now enjoy the episode. Hey folks, just a little bit of housekeeping before we launch into the episode. Please remember that all of the information provided in these podcasts is for information purposes only. We are never offering treatments, cures, whatever for any kind of disease or medical condition. Anything you hear about here is going to be intriguing. There's some research around it, but make sure that you check with your medical provider before you go off and do any of this stuff for yourself. All right. So enjoy the episode. And also if you're looking to connect with me for any reason, with your comments, questions, whatever it may be, you can reach me through my website, which is natnidham.com, or you can find me on Facebook in the Optimizing Superhuman Performance Group, or on MeWe in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group. And of course, you can also follow me on Instagram, which is at Natalie Nidham. Natalie is with an H between the T and the a, the second A. So thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you guys. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back, guys. Today's episode is going to be amazing. Um, I am here with Kristen Weitzel. I finally rem- I finally learned how to say her last name properly today. I think I've called you pretty much everything but Weitzel over the last months. Uh, Kristen is the founder of Warrior Woman Mode, uh, which is a program and I'm going to say kind of like a tribe and a culture that transforms women into the healthy powerhouses that they were meant to be. And she does this using some really interesting stuff. I mean, yeah, she does the fitness, the nutrition, but the magic of 
Kristen is in the biohacking that she does, which is what we're going to talk about today. So welcome to the show, Kristen. I'm so excited to be here with you today. I'm so excited to record with you as well. We're, it's been a joy to get to know you. And now we're being a little formal in our friendship. So um, yes, I, I want everybody to know how much I already love you before I even showed up here on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, the feeling is mutual. And we've had, I, well, we did try recording once together, but we had this disastrous IGTV <laughs> experience. It was my first IGTV. I literally felt like a geriatric doing that because I was like, oh my God, I couldn't get it to work. Then I cut out. It was a calamity, <laughs> but you were very gracious about it. It was fun. I love an IG live. There's always system systemic and technological difficulties. And we just, we worked it out best we could. And now we're here. And now here we are. Exactly. So, um, Kristen, Kristen's I'm going to say one of Kristen's hallmarks right now is the incredible work that you're doing in the breath space and also using really interesting to many people, scary modality, which is this, um, I can't remember what I'm supposed to call it anymore, but cold exposure, ice baths, the whole idea of immersing your body into, well, I see water, um, which is, you know, it's, it's gained a lot of traction over the years. Like for, I would say five, six, seven years ago, people just thought that crazy people did that. Turns out that maybe people who don't want to be crazy should be trying this. Um, but before we really launch into that, what I would love is if you could share with us a little bit about your journey and what brought you to this, this particular flavor of biohacking? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I really, I have been really curious my whole life. I grew up a dancer. I usually uh, open by saying that when I'm talking about my origin story and it was a very big part of my life until about 15 years old. And I thought I could be a prima ballerina. I can be all these things. And I um, was sort of of the era of, you know, dance wasn't necessarily fitness, but you were getting fit and I was young and I was healthy, but it was also a little bit of a, um, there was some body shaming in that, in that mm -hmm. arena. And there was some really challenging um, instruction in the world, because if you wanted to be a ballerina, the idea was that you were as little as possible in, in many ways. And, and it isn't like that anymore. Thankfully, if you look at the prima ballerinas at New York city ballet and whatnot, but I was, I was, I noted really quickly about how, like what I'm eating affects my shape and how is, how does food play a role in this scenario and how can I kind of be healthy and feel good and also still be doing ballet? Um, when you start, when I start to get to about 16 years old, I have a big surge of beautiful hormones and I go through puberty and I wake up the next morning with um, quite a shape. And that was a little bit of a challenge, I think, for that long, lifelong career dream I had. So you win some, you lose some thing, you know, I've gone to do amazing other things, but it's mm -hmm. where I got my first taste of thinking about somewhat negatively in some cases, but also thinking about an understanding like how we use food as fuel, how we use food to define what our physique looks like, what I look like in the mirror, how I felt. And I think that really sparked this big curiosity in me to discover ways that I could do it better or feel better, or just really as a kid thinking what, what would make me feel best. And so I leaned into that a bit. And I, by the time I was 18, I was like, I had tried veganism, vegetarianism. I had bought a juicer, uh, which was super weird back then. Like for someone my age, and I was like having it, bringing it to my grandmother's house for the weekend when I, and I was juicing vegetables and it, I was just like young and reading books. And it, somehow I knew back then to not really juice a lot of fruits even. And I read this book by the diamonds, uh, the husband and wife of diamonds. That was about food combining, which was like, yeah you know, not, maybe not such a thing, but back then it was like, try the different things. Let's see. And so I was like deep in it, deep in it for someone who was probably a teenager out meant to be having a little bit more fun than that. I was <laughs> 30. But so I got a chance to try all that. I went to performing arts high school. I danced, I sang, I did musical theater, whatever, and, and just continued that trajectory. The long story short, you know, over the course of the next, almost too late for that, but the, the next, you know, 10 or so years, I started getting more involved in different kinds of fitness modalities. I started, I, I had a partner um, in my late twenties who was very interested in this whole, like how can we get more energy from the foods that we eat? We read a book um, that was called clean by younger, 
we adhered completely to this 30 day plan. It was like one meal a day type of a thing, but very uh, pre paleo primal. Like it was okay. about how you clean up your diet and what foods you eat when it was very low carb. And, um, and I, I could not believe the amount of energy that I got from doing that for 30 days. And I thought there's something here. And then we just dug in. I was like, I always talk about this because I was lucky enough to have a partner while I was like working my corporate jobs and things. My partner was at home researching a lot. He was a big research nerd. So he would like work and research. And then I'd come home and he'd like, here's the summarization of this new thing Mark Sisson just put out. And we, oh my we God, got, that's amazing. We were so lucky. And then we, my we, husband's we, eyes glaze over whenever <laughs> I talk to him about this stuff. He's like, know, what is it I, that you want me to do exactly? <laughs> And I'm still very close with, this is my ex now, but like, I'm still very close with him because we really bonded for the 10, 11, 12 years we were together over that. Just the, the, it's really easy when you have a partner or a friend, and this is like a great message for anyone listening, getting an accountability partner and being able to keep a house or keep a, a circle of friends that are really like aligned with your vision. So you have some accountability and you have some community is a super important thing. I think that's bled into the work I do now. But so we went through Mark Sisson, all of his work. I dove in. I was like going through the primal nutrition thing and going through paleo. Mm -hmm. And then it was Dave Asprey. And I was like, butter in my coffee. This is crazy. And it was like, let's try it. And then it just, I, it, it kept growing and growing and growing. And so all of this has sort of led, you know, led me to the, the dance, led to yoga teaching because I still wanted to move my body in a beautiful way. Then I grew into learning how to lift weights and understanding physique and I did 15 years in the corporate world with consumer packaged goods. Amazing career, super fun. Got to run a lot of great brands, helped launch Red Bull Energy Drink when we thought it was a, wow. a really healthy beverage in the world. <laughs> um, no slight on Red Bull, love them, right? But just different type of functionality. And yeah. after that, I just realized, I think, later than my friends and family did, that what I needed to do was leave the industry and do fitness, wellness, and health and well-being because it's what I just had in my veins all yeah. the time. Yeah. And so that's the big trajectory of how I got here. And I, I think the, the one of the most important things that I've learned in the journey is when I was in this place, discovering myself and some of my self worth, I was, I was pretty awful to myself in the mirror. And I was, um, I tell a little story sometimes where I, I used to like kind of hit myself in the head with a hairbrush, like getting ready in the morning and, and things because I was just not happy with the person who I am, or I couldn't fit into the mold that was someone was telling me I needed to be in, whether it was society or media or the dance community or whatever. And I think I still see us metaphorically doing that to ourselves as women a lot. And it's why mm -hmm. I choose to work with women. It's why I called my business warrior woman mode. It's not just about like fighting. It's also about how we can be like soft and self caring warriors for us and our communities and how we treat ourselves well turns into how we help everyone else else feel good about themselves. And so that we have to start in, in, at home in our own bodies. And that's, that's, that's the trajectory, right? That's the, like, I don't, didn't used to talk about the shame, but there was so much shame as a kid mm -hmm. and that helped fuel me to get me to a place where I was like, how do I get women out of this and younger women even, right? So they don't have to go through the time that I, I went through when they're younger. So wow. it's been interesting. I love it. That's amazing. Okay. So we alluded, so, you know, I think everybody kind of gets the whole fitness thing, the nutrition thing. Um, I mean, I'm sure you have a brilliant approach to nutrition. Maybe you want to talk about that a little bit because you specialize with women. I mean, there's so much work and this is, I find this mostly in the last couple of years, like not in the, it hasn't been so long that w uh, women approaching women's nutrition as, and looking at this whole idea of our monthly cycle and how that can and should and will impact how you nourish your body when you choose to do, to apply different levers, if it will, um, the choices that you make. I mean, all these women that I see trying to be keto all the time. And, you know, we're going to talk more a little bit. I think you talk, you speak maybe more and work more with the, the premenopausal group. So women who are still cycling and who are so hell bent on being ketogenic all the time and not understanding why at some point, like they hit this wall, they can't perform. Yeah. And it's really when I came across you and a few other women in this space over the last couple of years, where I started to hear women talking about, well, look, we have a cycle, our hormones are moving, our bodies need different things at different times. So maybe you want to talk about that a little bit, because 
nutrition just sounds like you know, people are listening, like, yeah, I eat vegetables and whatever. Um, but there's so much more to women's nutrition than, than exactly what you're eating. There's when you're eating it and how you yeah. approach it. Yeah. I just think that the, the brief, the brief important points on it are, you know, like Stacey Sims does a great job of talking. She's been in this industry in the fitness industry and, and talking about working out training and eating with your cycle um, for a very, for much longer than I have, but she's like, women are not small men. And I think that that's a big piece of this, this puzzle is that how do we, how do we take care of ourselves? Of course, we're all bio individual. Everyone's going to be different, Yeah. but there is start. something to be said for in our reproductive years, understanding a couple things, which are number one, there is a time of the month that we are having a dominant 10 day estrogen rise and spike. 10 to 12 days, depending on different parts of the cycle, whatever, but because we're all a little different, but the, in that predominant estrogen state and the few other variables, we do have a little testosterone bump then we have other things going on, but that's the time that we have hundreds of studies that have backed up that we can build 33, 40% more muscle studies. I average it about 33, 35% more muscle during those tens of 10 days of the month versus training any other, any other time of the month. So like, if you said that to men, I say this a lot, <laughs> if you told men these 10 days a month, if you worked out, you can build 33% more muscle and like 28 to 45% more maximal power. There would be like Rod Hall, 10 days to massive muscle building program. And it was like, <laughs> we would be having that. It would be in existence. It would be, you know, Billy, you know, there would be no Tybo. There would be that or whatever. It would and be a thing. Those, it would yeah. be a thing. So those 10 days are important. I think the one thing I want to say to women is do a little bit of the research and the reproductive years about how important those 10 days are. We recognize because estrogen is anti-catabolic. That just means like it's not, it's going to stop the muscles from breaking down. So it helps build them when you're, when you're working out. So those are the days to go hard. And we have this perfect thing, which is estrogen also makes glucose uptake into your muscles a little bit easier. So what the heck are we doing being keto during those days? Let's work out really hard. Let's layer in programming cycles. And when we go to the gym and we're cycling food or we're cycling fitness, it's super important to realize that we can't just be in like phase one, phase two, phase three, build muscle, hypertrophy, cut like we normally can. I'm starting to work with male trainers now, which is exciting to say, how can we take the phases of training and keep them relatively intact while layering them over cycle phases so that we can actually build muscle and do cut phases faster and eat the right foods. And I will say also to all those keto women, post-menopause, maybe, you know, let's, we could talk, that's another conversation for another day. Yeah. All the women that are diehard ketogenic fans, that the 2% of body fat that I wanted to shift and the 2% of muscle that I wanted to gain the most in my life, the time that I did it was when I was literally feeding myself liquid carbohydrates around the times I was training. And it just doesn't always work to do something with, from, with an absolutist viewpoint. It just doesn't always work for our body. So just a little bit to consider cycling other things in and out, yeah. right? Like I, I, my personal choice and what I do with many clients is I cycle keto and paleo. Yeah. But, but some people, there's a very strong case to be made that you don't have to just cycle a paleo level of carbohydrate that you can have days with bigger carbs and you, you put them in certain time windows, you can make it all magical. So there's no, dif you know, everyone has to choose their own eating style. Yeah. So th those are the big things on nutrition. I think sometimes like women are, I tell my female clients, it's day 18 today. What's your plan? And they're like, wait, what day is it? And it's like, <laughs> you know, at least figure out what day your cycle is because it's important for everything. And the big segue here is our cycle also affects our breath. Yes. Good segue. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> So no, that doesn't mean that you need to have more breath mints, ladies. Let's talk about what breath Kristen is talking about here. <laughs> so we just, all of the things that are going on with us hormonally do affect our breathing. There is a, a Patrick McEwen, who's one of the foremost authorities and researchers and science guys out there who I've studied and trained with the Oxygen Advantage program. He's written several books. His most recent one, beautifully, beautifully done chapter or two, um, I had met him at a certification program and he off the cuff casually said to me something like, there's some TMJ studies that are out there that are sort of saying that women 
uptake oxygen 25% less, like they have less carbon dioxide tolerance and during certain times of the month. And I was like, wait a second, what? that's important. And I want to know more about that. And I made him send me the studies and I still, I, 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 I'm better at reading research now, but a couple few years back, I was like very clunky at reading research. And I was like, Patrick, what's the story? And probing him. And, you know, certainly I wasn't the only one probing him. It's not like he wrote his book because I told him to, but it was like, I was very curious. He continued to do research. I think at one moment he felt like, I don't know if I'm, I'm a man in a position of telling women all this stuff. Like I want it to get out there, but is that okay? You know, and, and, and the answer is yes. And he wrote the book and he talks two chapters about how women, women's breathing styles are different and a chapter on how you can make your orgasm better by breathing differently. Like all the things love that. So wow, the important piece of some of this or the biggest aha moment is that there is a conclusion he makes that I believe is somewhat true that we, because of this certain time of our cycle, that's right before where typical PMS might hit that we have the way that our hormones are working, that we have this 25% less capacity to utilize carbon dioxide, which means take oxygen into our system. So basically it's 25% harder for us to get the fuel that we need from the breath. And if that's the case, it's gonna be harder to train. If that's the case, you're gonna get more pain sensitive. If that's the case, you're gonna be like not good at holding on to things so much anymore. And then you start to have like issues come up and it's around the PMS window. So his, he surmises quite intelligently with some research, a lot of the PMS symptoms that exist in the world are really a byproduct of this 10 day period of time or so, which happens like day 10 to 22. So it's a little bit later than an estrogen spike that leads up to PMS because we're not getting a, the same amount of oxygen that we normally do in other times of the month. So it's contributing vastly to this PMS, this premenstrual syndrome. Now that's not to say women don't have PMS issues or people aren't dealing with, you know, endometriosis or big pain or issues. Oh yeah. Challenge. Yeah. This is, yeah. But this is really talking about our rib cage size, our body size, our capacity with the fluctuation in hormones to take in oxygen. And so it's like also something that I'm going to think about when I'm teaching and coaching breath work in different times of the cycle when I'm going to train hard, because I know, okay, those, that, that there's going to be a period of time where it's like, I can be going hard, but it's harder for me than it is for a man during this part of my cycle to get the work done. Like what happens if you're a marathoner and you're getting less oxygenation? Yeah. These are important things. So I, I like to look at the numbers, talk about it. I think it's important. The important and the bigger challenge is, every woman is on a different day of the cycle at a different moment, right? So it becomes something you have to personally track. You have to get some insight on yourself and be able to understand like more nasal breathing and certain ways that you can regulate and downregulate your breath to be able to oxygenate with like sub maximal breath holds. All of this sounds super science and nerdy, but I like <laughs> teach it in my course and go around the world and try to teach it to people but ways that we can utilize our breath different times of the cycle to try to mitigate that and to, you know, to try to feel better faster, right? That's what we do in the biohacking space. For sure. So that's what I was going to ask. So understanding this, there are ways to train and to offset what might be happening in that window before the cycle, which happens to be this, the window. And I don't know if it's 10 to 12 days, but I know that coming into a cycle when a woman is like, full on into PMS, typically, again, as you said, so well, it depends, um, and is having these crazy carb cravings. And I'm at the point now where if, if I have a woman in that world, I'm like, this is not the time for you to be fasting. This is not the time for you to be restricting carbs. Your body is sending you a signal mm -hmm. that it needs something. It needs those carbs to build what it's doing right now. Um, yeah. So, so to bring in breath work at the same time and to change the way that you train. So how would you train in that, in that window differently than you might at another time? So you've done your big muscle building ahead of that, right? I'm not big muscle building ahead of that. There is some carryover, but the interesting part is like, if I'm doing strength training, especially day like five, it's a little early, but the day five to day so like day five, it's like day six to day 16 is about your 10 days. So I start at day five, I train heavier and harder. And when I'm doing, you know, cause I know you are an advocate of lifting heavy things that if you lift heavy things and you move quickly in the gym, 
you cautiously and quickly, you can create, you know, you're working all the energy systems, including your cardiovascular system. If I'm going to do um, nervous system holds, like walkouts with a barbell, if I'm going to do things that are slower or like a max lift, because I am going to have a response to it, but it's not necessarily cardiovascular where I need to get all of the oxygen in that third energy system, that breathing heavy. Yeah. I'm going to do my bigger lifts during the time that is sort of the back half of that where day 10, 11, 12 is starting because then I have that 10 day part portion of oxygenation. I also don't want to freak women out. Like there are times, <laughs> because here's the thing. Imagine, you go to, you yeah, go to I can imagine women class. sitting there going, Oh my God, it's hard enough for me to get to the gym. Now I have to like, how is this even going to happen? <laughs> so it's like, start with one thing, right? Scaffolding is a lot of what I talk about. It's like, start, do a month where like you really adhere to what's going on with your breath patterns and what feels good for that. Do a month where it's, because truth be told, there's many months that I'm like these 10 days. Cause I, you know, I passed 40 and I was like, okay, these 10 days, I'm going to take one rest day. I'm going to go hard every day. And if I hit all the energy systems, so be it. I'm going to mitigate my breath so that I can, because for me in this part of my life, I want to utilize every bit of estrogen that I have to be able to develop muscle and keep muscle and keep sarcopenia and keep muscle loss away. Yeah. And so that's super important for me, right? Everyone's going to have a different context. So that's the big thing is what's the context. And so how I cycle those things can be different, but I say to the women I work with, let's, let's scaffold it in. This way I do it everything. Because if I said to every woman that I worked with in a full tilt program that is, you know, working with me intensively for three months and 12 months total, all the things on the first day, they would walk out. They would be like, oh, yeah. you need my money back. I can't do all of this. So please, yeah. if you're listening to this, you know, and males, it's the same way as you're making habit change in your life. One thing at a time. Stick to it. Be proud of yourself. Be excited. Maybe you're dabbling a little in the next thing to come, but don't overdo it. If you don't scaffold it one at a time, it gets really confusing and then it gets impossible to measure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you never get to feel your way into what feels right and what doesn't feel right for you. And I think, you know, so often people come to us as coaches and are saying things like, you know, I've been jumping around from, I've tried everything. And what they've done, they have tried everything, but they've tried everything in the space of six months. And so that means they've spent four days on each thing. And, you know, we're in such a society and I'm exaggerating on the four days, but, you know, it's a couple of weeks here and a couple of weeks there. And we're in such a instant gratification society that, you know, and, and I don't blame anybody because honestly, you're just, you're working so hard trying to find that thing um, and not and not able to use an expression that you use so beautifully so often, they don't, they don't give themselves the chance to really lean into something, to really yeah. understand how, how it works and to tweak it before you jump to the next thing because, oh, that didn't work. Okay, yeah. well, I'm going to try this. Well, that didn't work either. And, uh, you know, and understanding, and as you're talking about building the scaffolding, which is like this small steps to big goals concept, um, really giving yourself the time to kind of sit with things and let it sink in before you either move to the next step or really say, this really doesn't feel right. So maybe yeah. this isn't the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just slowing totally, down really. Yeah. And nobody wants to do that, including me. I'm in, I'm as impatient as they get, yeah. but it's like we, as people are making changes and listening to your podcast with all the beautiful information that you bring to the world, and as people, I get a chance to work with women specifically, there is a case to be made that we are just not caring for ourselves optimally by expediting everything. Yeah. Because this is the patience that is required for progress. And there are many, many times that I will say to a client, this is the thing, this is the thing that you need to do. And a week in, it's already like, this isn't happening. It's not going fast enough. I don't see any change. And we can't it's not, we have to love ourselves enough to hold big space for ourselves and to know that you will turn around at month three or four and you will go, oh, I'm here now. And look at all the, the steps are so small. You can't see them all. Yeah. And there's like some weird saying that I see all like Instagram all the time. That's like, it takes, you know, 30 days to feel better, 60 days for you to start to notice a change in difference and like four months for other people to notice, which is so annoying, <laughs> but it's like, 
you know, it's whatever the phrase is or the time period, you know, but it's like, you have to look in your mirror and, and, and metaphorically, I'm not saying you have to ever yeah, look in the no. mirror, but like, you have to celebrate the small wins and you have to say, okay, I did the thing today, even though I don't see any outcome yet, because this is what happens. Our bodies know, our bodies are like, okay, maybe you just, today you ate healthy, but the last 40 years you ate McDonald's. So it's not going to happen in a day, right? To be extreme right. in, that, in that example. No, but you know, psychologically we do. We're like, you know what? I didn't eat the burger yesterday. Why are my pants still tight? <laughs> you know, this is the same thing with breath. This is like breath. This is ice practice. We'll talk, as I know we're going to talk about that, but like with breath, if you spend one day doing a whole bunch of breath work, whether it be ecstatic breath work or just breath holds or down-regulated breathing or whatever style you do it for one day, you're not going to change your breathing pattern. You're not going to create a better, more functional body or cadence or stress management capacity by just doing it once. Like, is it great? Sure, it's great once. But like, if you really want to make some strong shifts and the easiest thing for anyone listening to this to be able to like radically change how they feel in many, many ways around breath, because a lot of us are over breathing from the mouth is to like, I set an alarm or I have a client set an alarm in the beginning on their phone. That's just an, when I'm coaching them one-on-one, I'm texting them every day about it. But they're like, damn it. It's like, how am I breathing right now? It will be like an alarm that goes off. It's like breath. And all it is is a reminder to check in and be like, is my mouth open? Am I in stress? Where are my shoulders? Am I breathing through my nose? So if you can concentrate and make some awareness around any time of the day that you are closing your mouth, breathing through your nose, not in fitness, not in anything crazy, just while you're sitting on your 92 Zoom calls every day or walking the yeah. dog, that you're nasally breathing, you can make drastic shifts and improvements in everything from breath to health to weight loss to sleep. It's a starter. It's foundational. You and I talk about this a lot. It's foundational. It's huge. Yeah, no, it is huge. So let's, let, let's talk about those di different styles of breathing. So with ecstatic breath, I take it you're talking about kind of like, hol is that like holotropic like breath? Holotropic. Breath? Because sure. I did, I did, I did a workshop. Well, not it's like an hour session. I've done this on Sundays a couple of times with with a guy who does it online. I think you know who he is. Um, and I will say that the first time I did it, I was like, "Holy crap, that was ridiculous! Like that was really intense." Yeah. And you do, and it's not for everybody because I also know people who've done it who are who virtually walked away. They they were like, "That was just crazy. Can't deal with that." But do you want to maybe talk about how you use these different breath styles in different situations for different people? And then I would love it if the last one you talked about started to kind of move us into our next topic, which I'm really excited and terrified about. Uh, although I've done a little bit of it myself, but not like you do it, <laughs> which gets us into that chillier space. Yeah, so. Yeah, sure. so just from a breathing standpoint, there's a lot of different styles of breathing. I spoke um, at a biohacking Congress uh, last year about um, breathe into better, which is something I say a lot because I think we can really breathe into better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we act, when we lose weight and you, you know, if you've ever seen the Ted talk, it's like, where does it go? Well, you're exhaling a good portion of that. Yeah. So that's interesting. But just breathing into better is, is when I spoke about it, I put all of these different styles of breath work and all these names of people and all these historical things on one slide and it was certainly by far the most photographed and shared slide of my entire presentation because people are hungry to be like, what are all the styles? And what it says a lot to me is people are typically speaking about this style or that style or this prescription of breath or this specific protocol. And what we need to be talking about is this is like dating when you're younger, like you try all the things on and you may have a propensity to one thing or another. So for example, if you want to talk about like holotropic or transformational or ecstatic breath work, I've done a lot of that and had beautiful moments and beautiful transformations and emotional release and all of these things. And that's awesome, right? So we may like that. We may be drawn to that. But if that's all we're doing, then we're repeating something in our system over and over again. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, there's, there are, you know, people are doing breathing for all different reasons and they should, people should do with their bodies what they want. I'm a firm believer in that. And if you're only ever doing something that is going to upregulate your system or give you emotional release or shift your pH and make you tingly and get you high, essentially, like you're getting high on your own supply. Yeah. It's an hour long of a breath of work session. And there are beautiful moments to happen in that. And you can do that too much. You can overstimulate your system in the sense of like, you're just like that getting high part. And while you 
you know, that's cool. And getting emotional release is cool. And releasing trauma is amazing. Also, if you're doing that all the time, every day, you're actually training your body to overbreathe. And then you go into your normal life and your habit has become overbreathing. So I'm very, uh, I'm very open to say, people come breathe with me, breathe. I, I mean, I try to teach different styles and types of breathing, but breathe with me, breathe with Casper Vandermeulen, breathe with holotropic pr practitioners, breathe with Wim, breathe with all these different people, because what you want is you want to be a promiscuous breather. You want to get around town. You want to check out all different breath slut. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful opportunity to be able to see what you like. And remember, like sometimes I love to do this rotational core movement in the gym. You know what I need the least? The rotational core movement. What I, what I, what I should be doing is single leg death lifts. I don't want to do them. So remember that the things, sometimes the things you don't like initially are the things you might need the most. And then vary it up and be like, you know, be a breath slut. Just get around and see what's out there. The other big thing to talk about with this, and this will lead us into ICE, is that we are all coming off of two years of crazy. Whether yes. Nobody's not had at least a little bit of an uptick of like, oh, fear or panic or what's going on or, you know, full Even stabilization. Sitting, sitting for hours upon hours a day. Like we haven't been going anywhere. We haven't yeah. moved in the same way. And like I noticed the, the last time I sat this much is when I went back to school to study nutrition and I would be, my butt would be in my chair for hours every day because I would be in class, then I'd be studying, then I'd be, you know, doing whatever. And at the time, I mean, I developed back problems and this, in this last couple of years, I feel like I'm starting to get those same, sen same sensations, you know, the, the shorter hip flexors and, you know, the butt that gets sore, but at the same time, like sitting down affects our breath dramatically. Dramatically. And as you said all that, I uncrossed my legs. I stood up a little more because it sat up a little more in my chair. Like what, look at who's, where are you right now while you're listening to this podcast? Are you in your car? Are you in a chair? What's your posture? Does it give you the best capacity for breathing? Are you breathing in your nose or out of your mouth? I mean, my poor, the woman who helps me with social media, the poor woman, she's like, <laughs> I'm like mouth breathing. Like I call her out during the day and we've ha we have a conversation and she understands that I will do that because she's trying to learn how to be better at it. So she's getting better at it. So there will be one or two times a day when I'm like mouth breathing. Like the Amazing. what a boss. How annoying is that from your boss? But <laughs> no, but, 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 you know, but, but, and the other thing that you said that I think is really important is the holotropic breath work or ecstatic breath or whatever it is that is, that can be so transformative at the time. What I love about what you said is you don't take that with you into your day. So it's almost like it's an intervention. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's a moment. It's an opportunity to shift. But that's not all the breath work you need. Like you need oh, no. the foundational breath work that is going to affect. And I'm also sitting up all of a sudden. That is going to, uh, but I might be too far from my mic. Uh, <laughs> So many things to think about, um, but the, the breath, the breath practices that are going to take you through the day and then how you breathe at night while you're sleeping. I mean, this is a huge deal with my husband who is a mouth breather and it drives me bananas. So, you know, I just ran out of mouth tape the other day and I'm like slapping it on him. And the poor guy is looking at me going, what are you doing? <laughs> But I'm like, it's true. because I love you. Yeah, it's the truth. It is because you love him. And all of those styles that are tend to be, let's just call them more upregulating, have beautiful explorations to really be able to, to move things through your body, right? That's what emotion is about. It's about you moving motion, like putting emotions through your body. But it's, it's the downregulating stuff coming off of these couple of years of, of extra stress. I've never had so many clients come to me as, I do now with anxiety and medicated and mm -hmm. all the things. And it's like, how do we first and foremost understand some of the physiological pieces of breathing and how do we downregulate our body? Downregulate is just a fancy word to say, take our nervous system to a calm, calmer state yeah. because we have sympathetic mode, which is fight or flight more or less. And we have parasympathetic, which is, <laughs> you know, rest, digest and have sex. And so it's like one of those two things, everyone's like, what did she just say? Rest, digest and have sex. I want hey, that. Hey, I, I want that. I want that one. <laughs> and so how do we breathe in and, and out of our nose? Eat and have sex. I mean, what could be, I mean, really what's what missing from this equation? <laughs> Seriously. So it's like, how do we breathe through our nose more? How do we exhale long? It doesn't have to be a very complicated process. So there are beautiful ways that you can downregulate your breath and it calms your nervous state. And the reality is 
when you, even when you feel, and this will lead us right into ice. I love it. When you feel panic or stress, car accident, baby's crawling out on the highway and you're going to run and save it. All of those things that are happening. You're wearing leather pants to a big conference in Vegas and you're nervous about it. No one knows that we're going to do that, but we're doing that together, you and me. But you're stressed yeah. out and you're a little nervous or you have something going on that feels like anxiety or panic or any of that, that that is a response. That's a natural response to your body feeling unsafe, right? And so that's okay. You just let it be how it is. But if you utilize the breath, which you can control mostly, and you reverse engineer your nervous system by shifting your breath to be breathing in the way that feels like you're calm, you're actually telling your body, you're calm, you're safe, you're fine. Your tunnel vision will then disappear. Your landscape will open. You can see and feel more focused and you can do the thing that you're intending to do, whether it's to save the baby from the highway or get in the complete the ice bath. You can do that thing by being aware and you can do it better than if you were like overly tunnel visioned and really feeling like you are escaping something in a way that is you are, you perform in sympathetic states. You typically perform half as well yeah. as you would perform during practice naturally or downregulated. So I learned that from firing firearms. I mean, it's a stat, you know, but it's like, <laughs> like welcome to America people, but no, like, <laughs> Oh my God, I'm Canadian. We don't do that. <laughs> I know, but safely, you know, learning about how the nervous system responds. Cause if you want to really understand the nervous system, you're going to do some things that feel scary. Right. So I've tried a lot of scary things, but the ice bath is a place where there are many ways to slice this. We can over oxygenate the system. We can off gas CO2. We can, we can do, we can work in various different ways and modalities before we get in the ice. What I like to typically do is to teach people how to fully downregulate themselves before they get in the ice, or at least have an understanding of that. So no matter how they step in, because you're going to have a response to sub 40 degree Fahrenheit water, that you have an understanding of how you downregulate. When you yeah. come to LA, we have to do an ice bath. So not- I'm laughing because i Kristen and I are, well, we're, we're going to be in Vegas together at an event and that, that I'm speaking at. And Kristen graciously said, I'm coming to see you. <laughs> I am. <laughs> like, oh my God. Um, and then I, as I, as I was all excited, cause we were going to meet in person, it suddenly occurred to me, oh shit, she's the ice person. Oh no. Does this mean I'm going to end up in the ice? And there's a piece of me, like I did a little bit of ice practice, I'll call it last year. Um, and I got a lot further along than I would have expected to. I never actually put ice in my tub, except that I did run full on cold water in the tub, which in Canada in November is a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been outside in the cold when it was minus 30 degrees Celsius doing okay. things. So that's pretty cold, but yeah. there's something about getting into a tub of water with ice cubes in it. A lot of them, yeah. Um, that, that is next level, right? So, so I will use strategies to teach my clients about breath work to lower their cortisol levels. This, you know, even inhaling for four counts, suspending for five and then, or seven, and then exhaling for eight. So you're exhaling longer than you're inhaling. Mm-hmm. And this sends these, all these signals to the nervous system brings it down. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how these things dovetail with the ice? Because I know that for me, just looking at whether it was a cold lake or the bathtub, not so much going outside. There's, it's not as intense going outside, nor is a cryotherapy chamber as intense either, because it's only a couple of minutes and I can make myself do anything for a couple of minutes. Right. But, um, but how, because I think the minute you look at that thing and you know that you're going in, your breath is going to become shallow. Like it's an, it's almost like your diaphragm freezes and you get this bouncy breath in the upper part of your lungs, which is exactly what you don't want. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. So, yeah, and the, so the, the ice is the one thing I say to everybody in the beginning is the anticipation of the ice is worse than the ice itself. Yes. That is, that's just 110% the truth for everybody. It's also let's, to be mindful. I also want to say, if you are um, recently pregnant or pregnant and never did ice before, if you have heart conditions, a pacemaker, if you have diabetes, or if you have some condition that should be checked out with a doctor before, absolutely, you, you want to know the contraindications for getting an ice because for some people it's contraindicated. So please, please make sure you know, because I will tell you how much fun the ice is. Type two fun is fun when you get out. And so <laughs> that I want you to um, explore it if you're allowed. And so yeah. um, ice 
to me is super second nature. Someone was filming me yesterday while I was in an ice barrel and I was like singing Guns N' Roses and they were like, is this even a thing for you right now? Like, are you even feeling cold? And I was like, not really. So if I can do that, anyone can do that. It is about utilizing the breath. And it is also about the, you do condition yourself to get acclimatized to the cold. We are in many cases, we've been over, um, you know, conditioned to be like going from air conditioning to air conditioning and temperature control is everything. And so mm -hmm. this is something that really builds back to longevity. There are long-term benefits that are 10 X for ice baths versus cryo and showers. It doesn't mean those things are bad. Short-term effects, Tons of research, cold showers are good, energy, sleep, cryo, skin conditions, sleep, lots of things. But if you want long-term benefits, if you want to live longer, better, if you want your cells to upregulate, if you want heat shock proteins and cold, cold shock proteins to fold better, better, which is just about if they fold better, your cells can communicate better to each other. And if you want to burn more brown adipose tissue, if you create more brown adipose tissue, which is higher mitochondria and helps burn the white tissue, which we tend to not like, in many cases, right? If we're yeah. trying to recomposition our bodies and lose body fat, that's white fat typically. And so if you want to do all those things, you have got to get in ice and you need to figure out a way to do it. That's stay fun and effective. And so that's, that's where the, that's where the game is. So how often, first, so I have a couple of questions. So yeah. how often do you need to get into the ice to get those benefits? And yeah. And so I'm going to give you the questions and then you can answer them in any order that you want. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So Perfect. how often do we need to do this? Like, is, do I need to do it once a week or is it twice a week or is it three times a week or can I do it once a month? And I'm sure it sort of depends on goals, but nevertheless, I'm sure there's kind of an optimal thing, just like with sauna. And I'm pointing here because I've got this funky little sauna sitting in my office. Um, you know, the kind that your head sticks out of, but because that's all I have room for. It's <laughs> 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 all I got. How about the combination of sauna and ice? Because for me, when I was doing this, the, you know, the degree of, of, of cold immersion that I was doing last year, I would get in the sauna first and I would get myself so overheated that I wanted to get cold. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. That helped me to kind of get myself into, into the water, but at my cottage where you know, the water temperature was getting down around 58 degrees where I was actually able to get myself into the lake and swimming for 20 or 25 minutes. I felt, and, and once I started doing that, I couldn't do it in the tub anymore because I like sitting still in water just felt wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but I felt like doing the sauna first and then the ice really helped me and so is there a benefit there to, to go back to back heat to cold shock proteins, that kind of stuff. And then back to the first question, which is how often do you have to do this? I'm done. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> I feel great. like I'm on clubhouse. Yeah. I'm no, complete. That's great. I am complete. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Contrast therapy is what we call it. Uh, there's so many benefits. Rhonda Patrick does a great job of breaking down all the benefits and the studies and the research around saunas, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Um, uh, there is a ton of, yes, heat shock proteins and, and health benefits to sauna. Contrast therapy as well, great to do. That means typically going from hot to cold. I, I, I encourage people who are starting a cold water immersion practice, an ice bath practice, an ice swimming practice, a deliberate cold exposure practice, whatever you want to call it, to start with one that you're going straight from just regular air where you are into cold to experience what that's like. Now, if it's something that feels way too scary for you and you think starting in a sauna is better, then who am I to tell you? Just do the thing you need to do to try out the ice. But contrast therapy is great. I do like to impress upon people. I say all the time, pros end on cold because what you're really wanting to do is you're wanting to finish with a cold plunge and get your body to work itself to re-regulate your temperature back up to warm on its own yeah. versus using the cheat of the sauna um, and vice versa. I never let people go directly from one to the other. I say take two minutes is what a lot of people yeah. say. I like to push people on three. It's the same reason I don't. It, look, if you're freezing cold and you need to do some air squats because that'll help you feel better out of the ice, fine, then do them. But what I try to get people to do is not do much because you want your body to do the work of regulating mm -hmm. the temperature and up leveling all the, the money. The big thing too with this is like shiver response. People are, I was going to say, you different. want the shiver response, right? Like you're going, for, if you don't have that shiver response, you kind of haven't pushed it hard enough, right? In so many ways, I mean, hyperth response. hyperthermia shivering. This is a, no, okay. 
Yes. Here's a great point. The, great, the piece is like minimum effective dose. So I'm going to talk about this thing I'm doing a social post on this week, which is Joe Rogan just got into a Morosco Forge for first he got in for less than a minute and then he jumped out because it was too cold. And then surely everybody texted him and said, you're not really strong uh, or whatever they did that they stayed <laughs> with ego. They, they shamed him back. Yeah. They shamed him back. And the next day he did 20 minutes. And what I want to say to, you know, and I get and, and said uh, Jocko and, uh, you know, a bunch of these guys are out here that are, you know, gonna, gonna push me to my limit and I can do it. And I, I did 20 minutes. I don't know how I did it. It's all awesome. David Goggins, Jock, they're all like cheering him on. Awesome. It's awesome. You, you broke edges, super hard to do. I also, a part of me on the inside gets a little sad because of two things, because I, I love all those men. I have Jocko wakes me up every morning. I have a recording of his that tells me to get to the gym. Like I, I've learned from lots of those men, like especially a woman coaching women. I had no choice in the beginning. I've learned from mostly males Yeah. and Goggins and all of that go hard. I love it. I love it. That's my personality. And when Joe Rogan has millions of followers and sits in the ice for 20 minutes, I know that number one, I'm losing a lot of people from ever trying an ice experience because by the end of the 20 minutes, if you watch his video, he's shivering a lot. It's, it's, he's given himself a maximum effective dose, right? He toughed it out. He muscled his way through because he's goddamn Joe Rogan and he can like Goggins, like Jocko, those people can. Okay. And like, is it, and yet, is it the healthiest thing for his cellular health? The answer is no, because he's ma maximum effective dose. He's a badass for sure. He's not going to die of hypothermia. Totally fine. And you want to structure it so that number one, you're getting a dose of stress, but it's not distress. It's you yeah. stress. And the hormetic stress. Positive hormetic stressor, right? Hormesis is the thing that we're giving ourselves a little bit past the edge of normal. And then our body upregulates and then we can step that up. We can scaffold that up. And again, not a knock on that guy, but I have four, he has 40, four, 4 million views or whatever of the video. And I love the Morosco Forge and I love the whole process, but I don't want to scare people off. And I also, my post is really saying, you get to do you. One minute in the ice, that's your PR, that's your PR. Like the research seems to say around three to six minutes, it could be a couple like times during, you know, get in, get out, get in, get out. And we talk about ending on cold and there's lots of different philosophies, but there's a decent amount of research when we talk about stress and our body's response to it about what's too much, like where we hit the, the threshold, like the allostatic load of stress in our body. When I first got in an ice bath, well, after the whole like news media on everything that's going on had hit, I was like, notably, it was harder to complete the ice bath because my body was already at a different level of stress. Right. But that's what I was going to ask you. We have like to manage that, you know, like we have to manage that piece to be like, what what's happening with um sorry we have to manage that piece to be like what's happening with our body at this stress moment and it's great to be badass and it's great to push our edges and it's great to go to the brink of failure because we learn but in many cases too we want to step there cautiously if you're first time ice bather don't get in for 20 minutes there's no, no need just get into the thing that's going to work for you. And also, if you're a first time ice bather, there is a moment between 30 and 90 seconds that I call the turnover. So when you get in and it's cold and you have a sympathetic response and you try to bring your breath down and calm yourself into that cold ice, know that your body's initial response is just because it wants to like save you in the short term. It doesn't know you're controlling the ice bath experience. It's going to tell you loudly, get, get out, out, get out, get out, <laughs> get for out. 30 to 90 seconds in some cases. And that turnover typically happening around a minute is I use that phrase because I want people I've, I've coined the phrase. You heard it here first, because it's like, when you get to that turnover, you will be amazed and aware that your body goes, ah, oh, she's not kidding. She's going to stay in here for a minute. He's not kidding. He's doing this ice thing. It's going to shunt the blood to your organs. It's going to shift your physiology and you're going to go, oh, and you're, and you're using your breath and your body, you're going to feel like, oh, it just sort of got 1% easier. Why did that happen? And that's the turnover. And, you, and I've put, oh, I'm, I'm about a thousand people on the ice at this point. And it's a beautiful moment to watch someone because it is about the surrender, mm -hmm. right? The surrender to, I'm going to try to stay out of this stressful response. I'm going to be aware of what's happening. I'm going to think about my nervous system. I can't think about much else. It's freezing cold. <laughs> You're very in the now moment. And I'm going to sit with this and be okay and say, how do I manage this? And you know what? As it goes in the ice, it goes in life. Where you give up, 
you give up. So like it will make you a better driver, a better stress manager, a better parent, a bit healthier on a number of levels. And ice is a thing, right? And it's like the other question you had, which is how many times I'm very big proponent of conservative conservatism with women who are still in their reproductive years, because I did a 34 day ice challenge. I tested before and after I've read some research. There's not a lot of great research out there about women. Welcome to things as they are. But I have seen with myself and anecdotally with clients um, who have any challenges around hormonal dysregulation that icing every day makes it worse. Okay. Well, it's too much stress. So I think it goes stress. back to what you were saying earlier. It, it moves from a hormetic stress, from hormesis, which is adaptive stress, the kind you want, into too much of a good thing, literally. Because I, I was even going to ask you, like people with adrenal fatigue, for example, people who are in a you know, overstress, their cortisol is too high chronically. Like this is not possibly what they need right at this minute. Right. So anyway, but going back to what you were just. Yeah. Understanding aliphatic load, understanding what your stress, but how Sean Wells would say how full your stress bucket is like that's important. And you don't need to do it every day. You will get the benefits two to three times a week. Look, I'm also going to say some things that are like, oh, yes, go to your doctor first. But many of, the, many of the, I talk to a lot of the people who run ice. And here's the other thing is like, I, I have a prescriptive of how many, a prescription of sort of how many times I'm doing it during the week. And the days that I'm not doing ice, I'm doing red light therapy. And I'm like balancing it all out. And so it's great. There's other biohacks to be done. There's other fitness modalities, nutrition. You know, I, I, I will do breath work on a day. I'll wrap you. I know you are a fan of the flex beam like I am. So I'll put the flex beam on. I'll use it to do some breathing. The flex, we have our flex beam boas. Oh, I just turned it on by accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we keep our flex beams around and, and that's great. So I will alternate days with that. But when you are doing deliberate cold exposure and you are putting yourself into that stressor, you're getting benefit, but there's no need to do it every day. I also like to say that, that I'm comfortable with saying that for men as well. Men have a bit easier time doing it every single day, potentially. But getting in sub-40 water, reverse engineering your breathing to make your nervous system calm and understanding how you can behave in stress so that when you're in other parts of stress that may be a little bit less acute or are similar, you know how to, you can behave at, in an agile, highly focused way without being in such a fight or flight state where you're um, distracted or, or per- performing less, right? That's what yeah. it kind of comes yeah. down to. Well, it almost feels the way you describe it, it almost feels like the, the turnover point is where you, your body or your mind, your mind starts to trust that you are in control, that this yeah. is not being done to you, that you are willfully doing this. And it's a little bit kind of one part of you saying to the other part of you, we're going to be OK. I got you. And totally. that's and where one- that that, you know, that that primitive part of your brain just kind of which is a tough one to communicate with because it's all about the instant reaction, but where that primitive part of the brain kind of goes, all right, I'm only giving you so much time. (laughs) Okay, fine. We'll, we'll shut it down for a minute. And that's, that's gotta be a beautiful thing. And to your point, you know, developing that ability to manage the, the yourself in that extreme stress moment and being able to carry that over into life where you get hit by something very stressful, very surprising, you know, have you found that this gives you that ability to have that, that momentary pause bef- that, that prevents you from just reacting with full panic right away? Yeah, like, it builds into the system. Yeah, 110%. Like it, build, it builds in resiliency. It builds in mental toughness. Like it just, you... In the beginning of coaching people on the ice a number of years ago, I always thought, oh, well, like there'll be young people that are like super vital and really healthy and they'll get in and they will do it no problem. And then like I had some people of like an older population getting in and corporate executives and people running like, you know, big movie houses in Hollywood and getting in the ice. And I was like, well, maybe that's a little scarier in their response. And I was absolutely polar, like I was completely wrong. It was a completely opposite. But you know why? Because someone who's running a movie house in Hollywood has been a kin to all these stressors and managing big teams and doing all this stuff and gets in the ice and is like, I got this. Yeah. Even if they're freaking out on the inside, they know how to manage it. 
And so, and then someone younger would get in who is just interested in an Instagram photo. And that's, and that's not to say that it's young, Insta- whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Younger, get in, then they just don't have experience with stress at that level. Or if you're in it for the wrong reasons, it's great to go there for an Instagram photo. I love people who come because they just want one crazy photo because many of those people come back because they actually realize, holy shit, this is amazing. Right. I feel vi- I have so much vitality. I, you know, if you cup, if you're using like ice therapy and breath and you're, or cold therapy of any kind, and I believe the sauna is super helpful for sleep and all of that. But when, if you're using ice of any kind and you're using red light in your life, like you are, have two modalities that are going to help you with one of the number one foundations of your health and well being, which is getting better sleep. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, there's just, there's no substitute. I know it can be challenging to have an ice bath set up at your house or do all the things, but there are ways to, to slice it and figure it out and try to do it and, you know, create, just create a pathway to health and well-being. You can also do little ice parties, you know, <laughs> have people, we just did a thing down here where we're like, have an, a big ice set up. We went and got a bunch of bags. My favorite place in Austin, it's a little machine. It's literally like a <laughs> drive up on this machine it's called twice the ice and you just load it full of coins or your card or whatever and it gives you all this ice and i felt like i got to take a picture this is my favorite place in Austin. i saw that picture it's hilarious you're in the car and there's giant bags of ice next to you it's we have we have a delivery service in toronto called the ice man that's that awesome. we used to use. I used to plan events a long time. Well, I planned events for a very short window of time. And uh, you get to know the ice man because he will deliver as much ice as you want. Yeah. And it's awesome. So it's like, if, uh, and even if you're like not that savvy of like figuring it out, you just call all your friends, you get the tub and then you tell everyone to bring two bags of ice. You know what I mean? Enough people come, you fill up an ice tub and then you can all kind of do it and have fun. And there's like a great bliss chemical dump in your brain, right? You have like norepinephrine, you have oxytocin when you do it with other people, which is a big bonding chemical that makes you feel like oh, you get a dopamine hit. And then you have the most beautiful thing that happens, which is however many minutes you do stay in the ice, when you get out of the ice carefully, slowly and safely, you, you can tell that I've said that a lot. When you get out of the ice, you have a parasympathetic rebound which is the moment in time when your body is like, I'm safe. This is amazing. All the chemicals have been released. I'm starting to warm up. Oh my goodness. This is incredible. Those are the times when the really stoic philosoph- like philosophizing, you know, corporate executives are on my rooftop or at the facility and they're like singing Broadway show tunes because like it's a complete beautiful under, you know, peeling away of some of the layers. And so it's really I, I love a lot of this coaching in this space around breath and ice because you start to really learn about people's beautiful personalities as they showed up in this world, as they are maybe in their personal lives versus business or their younger selves versus their current state of stress load. And that's, it's just, it's insanely beautiful to watch. And I think it's also that plus all the health benefits it brings to the table makes it feel like just such a great practice, right? Really being able to understand breath, understand using ice, and understand laying the, layering the other pieces in, you know, and, and going all the way back to the doorway of like working with women, you know, there's no better or bigger, more important community in my world that needs to be able to work with these tools to be able to lighten our stress load because the less stressed we are, the more we can live into our dreams and the more we're fulfilling our dreams and we're feeling joy, the more that everyone around us in our communities feels joy. And it just feels like the way, it's like the way of the future. Getting the ice, get, it's like getting the ice, red light, breath, wave the future, work it all out. <laughs> Just deal. You know, so, um, yeah, so I love that. And I mean, so on the, in terms of the ice, the last, before we move on to red light, because I do want to talk about red light a little bit, because it's, I mean, we both just held up our flex beams for anybody who's, who's watching on YouTube. Um, um, but before we move on to the red light, why don't, like, what are the, just the, the nerdy health benefits of the ice? So there's conversion of white fat to brown fat. So the white adipose tissue to, to brown adipose tissue, which is thermogenic and it's active and it burns calories and it torches the white fat. But what about on a cellular level, on a mitochondrial level in terms of um, any like circulatory, I know it's like this pump, like, yeah. So the one thing that's happening too, is that you are shunting blood all through. It's a big detoxification and a big sort of microcirculation support because you are shunting all of the blood in your body to the, 
per, the, to the core from the periphery. So from your arms and legs into like the core where all your main organs are, right? Because your body wants to protect the organs. This is sometimes why people will feel tingling in their toes or their fingers when they're in the ice, sort of even correlated to sometimes that, the shifts in that happen when we're doing different styles of breath work. Like if you're breathing a certain way in the ice, you can also create a tingly sen sensation. Yeah. But um, so we are, you're really circulating the blood in a very big way because you're shunting as much blood as possible your body's doing this naturally. You're not paying any attention to it. You're just cold. And then when you get out, your body then releases that blood again. And it's sort of getting a big circulation detoxification um, of your body. And then it's like the heat shock proteins in the sauna and the cold shock proteins in the ice are a very big deal. That's like, we want our cells to be more like grapes than raisins, right? We want them to have plenty of hydration and fluid and intracellular water. We want them to feel like they, the proteins that are in and around them are folding well so that they can communicate to each other because the better they talk to each other, the better everything functions in our system. Um, the, the mental toughness component to me is a thing that, I, you know, as a yoga teacher in my past life, and I talked about being a dancer and a yoga teacher, I put people who had not been upside down since they were little in handstands, whether it be in the middle of the room against the wall, it didn't really matter. Those people walked out of the room like they had just had sex for the first time. They were like, yeah. yes this is amazing. I can conquer the world. And that, that amazing, beautiful attitude comes when people come out of the ice. And I, I have definitely had students who have had water trauma, who have taken a lot longer and gotten a lot shorter stints in the ice sitting and getting through it. I've had students that are processing or, or participants that are processing other types of trauma where the, the ice is challenging because it's bringing up emotions in them. All of those things are work outable as long as you just go slowly prescriptively and for what's comfortable for you. And so there are ways to process things that are in our body. There are ways to upregulate our cellular health. There's way, ways to boost mitochondrial function, add brown adipose tissue, boost our brain chemistry, right? If you want to talk about a mood booster, one of the oh, biggest yeah. things you can get from being in the ice is really understanding how you think it would give you more anxiety, but because of the rebound afterwards, it's teaching you how to just, you get the, bl the, bl the bliss chemicals of the brain that make you feel better, right? Yeah. It makes you sleep better. And then, like I said, the mental toughness component and the confidence level, I think is really, when you have someone come and someone will go to a class or do ice with me a few times, or one of my clients who just did exclusively an ice and breath eight weeks with me, which was super fun to do, is like, I'm going to have an ice party, people at my house, little barbecue, when everyone will do ice and breathing with Kristen, that happens. And I watch, I get to watch my client own the room because my yeah. client has been through ice and feels comfortable and confident and then can say to her friends almost in a capacity like I would, I know you can do it. I'll sit right next to you by the tub or, you know, and it just feels like you, I watch someone transform in eight weeks or less. And sometimes less than that, where they're just like coming back to their second or third ice and they bring a friend and then they're like, they know what to tell their friend because they've conquered this thing. And then it's like, what's the next thing? The next thing might be performance breathing or a little longer in the ice or a little colder or whatever the, whatever the adaptation is we're trying to create, right? This is all about stimulus and adaptation. And it's great that you asked me to talk about the benefits because this is, it, it is also, yeah, it's fun and it's exciting but repeatedly doing this is creating a small stimulus that creates an adaptation for longevity, right? Like women have been Love putting it. their faces in ice cold water for years, trying to keep like the skin soft and supple and doing all the things, you know, it's like we, we are using, we've been using cold for a very long time. This is not a practice. We've been using saunas for a very long time, hundreds of thousands of years, if, you know, if not thousands of years, because of it's a practice, especially in Europe and uh, you know, ice swimming and all that. So it's quite exciting. I love it. I, now I can't wait. I'm super excited. I'm going to, I'm going to start adapting though, before I come. Yeah. I think showers. I have to adapt cold <laughs> towers and maybe even the tub, who knows? Well, and I've got a lake and you know, the lake's colder this year than it's been because we've been hurling rain on a regular you know, basis. I checked my meat freezer before I left though. Cause I have a meat freezer sealed and filled with water as well as an ice sub. And it was like 32 degrees girl. <laughs> <laughs> All That's right. Cool. There's going to be photos. a delta. There's going to be a delta. There's going to be photos. There's going to be sure. photos. So you mentioned red light a couple of times, and yeah. I'm a huge fan of red light therapy for a lot of reasons. And I think we both actually, and I mean, you're more involved with the company than I am, but we both came to Flexbeam. I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Frost hmm. last November, who's amazing, who oh. developed this Flexbeam, which is such a game changer, I find, because 
I mean, I, not that I don't love my panel, like it's great, but it requires me to go and stand in front of it. And, and I never know exactly how far away. And I will say that having had a shoulder injury in the last little while, the, fle- the this, this skin on this, this device that actually sits on my skin has in 10 minutes shifted things in my body that I haven't experienced before. Like I was getting a muscle spasm behind my scapula, which happens on occasion. And instead of it spinning itself into a frenzy and sending me into like a panic because, you know, I'm not going to be able to breathe for a few days. I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll just put my flex beam on and see what happens. You know, maybe I'll try red light therapy. And I really actually, even though I know intellectually about all the benefits of red light, I was shocked that it, it, it's, it stopped the spasm. It took a couple of days to resolve but it stopped the spasm. So maybe let's talk about it and why, you know, let's talk a little bit more about why, what makes this device, aside from the fact that it's really portable and really convenient, a bit of a game changer in this whole red light game. Yeah. And I love that it's targeted. I think for me, like, you know, a lot of people out there probably have this lifestyle, even within like the space of what we're all going through, which is like, we have kids, we have things, we're on the go. Like I, I wish that I had time in the morning to sit in front of a red light panel and, and turn around or 19 panels or whatever to like stand and do. But I, I just don't have that. And I, like, I always think it's funny. I don't know what people think. I drive a purple Jeep. And when I go to the gym in the morning, I usually am like driving at six o'clock in the morning to go to the gym I work out at and I have the red light therapy device on. I have a bum shoulder that this has been super game changing for, but I'll put the red light therapy device on my shoulder, if I'm feeling it from a workout to use it for recovery, but mostly there's research that talks about prepping your muscles be, for, to be able to go and lift and do yes. things like that. And so I'll utilize it. And, and even some mornings, I just will wrap it around my midsection to diaphragmatically breathe, use it as tactile feedback and get the benefits of the red light at the same time. But I'm, I'm driving down like the highways of California. So if anyone's ever seen this, like honk and wave in my purple Jeep and it's 6 a.m. So the sun is not really fully up yet. And the whole thing is like red on the inside. It's absolutely ridiculous. I'm sure that people are like, who is that bougie chick with some kind of disco light? But it's, I love the flex beam because it goes everywhere. I travel with it. It's like an easy carry case. I have it in my, in my suitcase or I have it in my car. I put it on friends. I like, and a lot of times I'm like, oh, you have this thing and it's an issue, client, friend, whoever. And it's like just using it once or twice. Many of them are like, I want to have this. How do I get it? But it's, it's the flex beam is awesome. And it's the biggest point of differentiation is that you're putting it. It's, it's, it does have a plexi overlay, but you're putting it on your skin. So proximity to the red light, proximity to near red light and red light are the things that are going to make the difference, right? In many ways, I'm not knocking people. I think panels are great. There's ways to do it. But if you're standing 50 feet away from your panel and you're dancing around with your kids, that panel isn't really doing much, right? Yeah, it's you not able get, to charge the mitochondria at that point. There's yeah, no- you want to get as close as you can. And so like, why not have, I'm not, I don't need to stand naked up against the panel, although that sounds fun, but I can put on the flex beam and I can go anywhere and I can just, you know, I tuck it sort of half under my sports bra around my waist or like, it's just every joint it comes with, you know, cause you have the straps, but it has three or four different strap sizes and you can strap it on one side or the other and like around any joint, any muscles. And for, also like I use it a lot for sleep. I just use it before bedtime because I'm an A-type personality that's on the go. I'm like a rocket ship and I need to take that 10 minutes. And it's like, great. You have the flex beam. I lay it down on my spine. I chill. I do some breath work, side body, put it on my stomach. I do some more down regulation breath. And then I find that my sleep scores are better. I can fall asleep faster. And it's just giving me that moment of pause mm-hmm. in the day. And it's like, I'm not going to crawl into bed with any other red light. To my-, <laughs> <laughs> me, I don't know. my panel is not coming to bed with me. It's not a thing. It also wasn't designed for that. And the flex beam was designed to be on the skin. I think the only part of the body, as we were talking about, that you wouldn't actually physically put it on is your face as yeah. much as there are benefits of red light and near infrared light for collagen production for the face. 
you might hold it out like a book and maybe not stare at it fixedly. Yeah, yeah. Just drop it to your head where you're like, I can't see anything. <laughs> no, yeah. although there's a thing about scalp, right? I mean, it is, it is amazing to me because of this effect of the fle- of that red light and near infrared light on mitochondrial upregulation. So mitochondria being those little energy factories that we have in our cells And even for people with issues with hair growth have found like red light therapy devices are an integral piece of virtually any hair regeneration program that you'll see out there, whether you're using peptides or PRP or um, anything else. And I know there's, I'd like to believe the evidence is strong enough now that there aren't people in the world, unless they're like people who have like a red light bulb from GE or something. Okay. That's a little different, (laughs) different but as long as you have a reputable red light device with the right wavelengths and all of that, like that, there's so much research as the dawn of time now and like utilizing it and Ruby laser history and all of these people that have like really broken ground for red light, that it's no longer woo woo, right? We have red light saunas, we have red light, everything. Mm -hmm. I just, it's, Every single device that I know of on the market is plug in. And this one is like, charge it, take yeah. it and go. And I'm go. not connected to anything. And it's so, it's just nice. It's like on me. And then I really, I'm like, okay, it's on my skin. I'm getting the full benefit. And I, and I can, I don't ever really do like big, crazy, like dance cardio classes with it, but you could like, some, some people wear it for fitness, you know, whatever. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think general, that- you know? That would be a thing. Well, did you ever, did you ever, were you ever exposed to that? Um, there's a story and I don't, I think, I think it became a thing, but there was a general, an older gentleman who had Parkinson's disease who, you know, I mean, it's amazing to me, the, the biohackers who don't know biohackers that we come across in the world. Right. Mm-hmm. So here's this dude who's developing Parkinson's. He's been told he has Parkinson's disease. He dives into research and he comes across some kind of research that says that red light may be beneficial for the brain. And he makes himself a bucket. Did you, did you ever see this? No, no, Actually, no. And he, does he fill the bucket with red light? Yeah. He filled the bucket with red light and he would literally sit there with a the bucket. I mean, it's hilarious, but here's the thing. It helped him. Yeah. Right. Wow. And, and I think that there's probably now a better device than a bucket filled with red light. But he was groundbreaking. Yeah, no, he was groundbreaking. And I think that it just speaks to the benefits of red light that some of many of which we know and so much of which we don't know yet. And I mean, for me, red light, I'm putting in this category of healthy aging, longevity, anti-aging, because anything you can do to charge up that mitochondria, those mitochondria is ultimately, it's, it's affecting your system at such a foundational level that is naturally going to upregulate your body's ability to do whatever it is that you need it to do for you, including sitting in the ice. And we're all, and we're all indoors way too much, right? We don't get sunrise and sunset and all the natural, you know, native red light that we, we should be getting, you know, should is the word, but like we, we, we used to we need, get. we've we need, evolved, we've we evolved a, to, to benefit from. Yeah. So I can sit at, on this Zoom calls. I can do, th- you know, I can do, I did flex beam this morning on calls. It's like, you can do, you can just do it while you're in stuck in the house. And that's like the beauty of it. I'm still, look, I'm still grounding. I'm still trying to get outside. Trying is the operative word because I don't always do it, <laughs> but I get sunrise. I get sunset from time to time and, and anywhere I can, right. Any, and if I could just have those moments to try to get that that red light in. Oh, and speaking of which, what's so interesting because for a couple of years, I've been saying to people like when you go out in the morning for sunrise or at sunset, you know, go with as little clothes as possible because there's this, um, there was a research study that came out as well as many people in the biohacking sphere talking about how, you know, you want to get red light and these wavelengths of light into your eyes. And by that, please, I don't mean stare at the sun, right? But if you want to get the red light into your eyes, you have photoreceptors in your eyes that remind your brain and the circadian rhythm and all the things. But I've been talking a lot about, you know, the study, there was a study that said uh, the photorecept, like our skin has photoreceptivity. Absolutely. Like a high. And Huberman just did a podcast and said the study was refuted and it's absolutely 100% not true. So that, that, you and that, I need to dig into that more, right? Andrew Huberman's podcast, he's a neurobiologist. Yeah. And so I feel like I talk a lot about that and it's a really good opportunity for me to have a growth mindset to think about, okay, what is really happening with my skin? Because now I'm very much on the tail of like, well, is there other research what's happening with it on the study that did exist is, was 
refuted because I guess there was some other, I think he said there was some other case to be made that there was actual light getting into their eyes, even during the, um, the study as it was held. So that hmm. the study was, was retracted or refuted. I don't know what the correct word is in the scientific community, but that's fascinating to me because this is whether, look, I tend to lean on the I'll believe Andrew Huberman side and this is a good proof point that the science is always out in many ways, right? We know mm -hmm. red light helps mitochondria. We know all the benefits of ice. We know all these things, but there's always more and more and more that continues to come out that we learn about. And that, you know, this experiment of N equals one, this biohacking sphere that we live in continues to be super interesting and intriguing because we get to all learn together every day. And it's like, why, you know, why, I, why I'm like, okay, cool. If that's not true and I'm speaking those words and I really need to understand what the science actually is and how it's working. This doesn't mean sun isn't going to give us vitamin D and 19 other benefits on our skin, right? There's plenty of benefits, but just like specific pieces of it, right? Where it's like how red light and wavelengths work from specific, you know, benefit standpoint. And then also how the, what the differences are with the red light therapy device, because we're getting that kind of targeted light on our skin all the time, right? And so that's a different thing from healing and mitochondrial function that we're talking about than being far, far away from red light wavelengths. Yeah. And I think the red light therapy device is not just about red light on the skin. It's about with the near infrared light and the red light, this is penetrating the skin. This is going in at a deeper level. So, uh, you know, I don't that's know. That's what I'm saying is different about the sunrise and sunset. There's benefits. We should be doing that circadian rhythm, but making sure we get it in our if eyes. Right? Else, you want to see it. Exactly. Because that's what's going to inform the pineal gland. It, it helps to orient your brain to reset your circadian rhythm, your circadian totally. cycle, um, which is so, which is so, well, powerful. I mean, you get so, yeah. so many of us and you and I see so many clients who their circadian cycle is gone. It's, yeah. it's upside down. There's no, it's, it's just very hard. There's no pattern. Yeah. Horses yeah. Like they've, pattern. Lost, they've lost their pattern, but helping people to reestablish that, you know, what's tricky there is it takes, intention because it's in our busy lives in modern life it's really easy to be in front of a screen exactly when you shouldn't be yeah. not be outside exactly when you should be or need to be let's lose should but when you need to be um and and deny your body these natural triggers that would help it to kind of align where it needs to align Totally. Yeah. And it's like, for me, it's just another case. It's like, I'm going to get light into my eyes. I'm going to make sure that's there. But in my mind, maybe I was giving, cutting myself some slack, like, well, you're out there in your shorts and your sports bra, whatever. It's just like, for me, it's another case of, of why I want to put the flex beam on during the course of the day, right? I can do it once or twice a day, 10 minutes and get that red light therapy or whatever red light therapy anyone's using, quite frankly, as long as they're using it. Yeah. Because it's like it's a hack that feels, I think, to some people like, can it be this easy? It's just shining light on me. And it's yeah, like, exactly. Yes. It's like, yes, it can be that easy. There's tons of research. Yeah. And people like um Zulia, who you interviewed, and Sarah Turner, and lots of lots of lots of really wonderful, strong women in the red light community, which I really love as well, learning from. There's devices that have come out like the V Fit, which is like intravaginal red light device, all of these right things. for toning. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah. So it's like, it, it exists in the world, you know, and, and it used to be that back in the day, I don't know, six or seven years ago, it was just, you know, Ben Greenfield yelling about putting red light on his testicles all day. It was like biohacking, but now we have our own devices, ladies. We're, we're exactly, we, we got it too. <laughs> yeah. So it's exciting. It is exciting. And really, here's the big piece, right? We want to tie it all in a bow. It's like, we are only as fit and healthy as what we can recover from. So like Absolutely. that's why we're talking about all this. Why are we talking about breathing and ice baths and red light therapy is how can we bolster our cellular structure and recover better because the faster we recover, the healthier, healthier we are. Love it. I love it. I think this is great. And you know what we forgot to say in our intro at the beginning of the podcast? We forgot to say that you also host a podcast. I do. I host a podcast called Well Power. Amazing. Well Power, it, which is yeah. a great podcast. I mean, I've tried to glean as much information from you as I possibly can. Uh, mostly, we, mostly Natalie and I like to call each other and signal and talk all the all the things and and never re release it for public consumption. <laughs> exactly. So we finally decided we're going to sit down and do this. So I'm so glad, I'm so glad that we did. 
I am too. So Kristen, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or anything that you, I mean, you've given kind of your final words there, but are there any other final words or how can people find you? Where can they get in touch with you if they'd like to connect with you on any of the topics that we've talked about today? Yeah, I think uh, it's easy to find me at warriorwomanmode.com. It's W-O-M-A-N, so singular, warriorwomanmode.com. I have a, a really beautiful 12 module course that's like introducing people into like fitness and nutrition and all of these biohacks, including a module on breath work and a module on red light and a module on how to manage eating and doing all the things in fitness with your menstrual cycle and different stages of your life as well, right? So reproductive years, post-reproductive years, menopausal, all of that. And it's a really more important than, than the, the course is amazing and all the content. I know I'm biased, but I've worked for years to put it together. The biggest thing is sort of going back to the, the thing we spoke about really in the beginning, which is just when you have community, when you have partnership, when you have accountability, when you have other, specifically in this case, it's a group of women that are powerful badasses together and they are supporting you. It gives you an opportunity to be, be the very most powerhouse version of yourself because you're not alone. Yeah. And there's no judgment in our circle, our inner circle, we call it. And it's really this, this beautiful place where everybody cheers each other on and asks questions. We just had a woman, I'm going to say she won the gold medal. You're going to think Olympics. It wasn't the Olympics, but for her age bracket in Taekwondo in Manila, she just won a gold medal. Um, she just recently got her black belt. So it was a very big deal for her in that class. And you know, Amazing. women are having successes and learning about sleeping through the night and doing all these things. So um, that course, Instagram is always a great place to find me, Warrior Woman Mode. My course is called Wow Factor. Wow stands for Women Optimizing Wellness. Love it. Oh, look at you. <laughs> and, you guys uh, have to check out wow. YouTube just to see, just to see that. <laughs> um, and yeah, I want, and I love getting DMs. You know, I'm here. It's like, you know, whatever your your lifestyle whatever your questions whatever your queries and, and I know Natalie you're the same it's like we want to help as many people as we possibly can so don't hesitate to ask the questions and you know share your story I really um I'm here to support women and lift them up in every way that I can whether you're dming me on instagram getting in my course working with me one-on-one -on -one or what have you I just want people to women specifically to really love themselves the most that they can so they can serve their communities and their dreams the best I love it. Thank you, Kristen. And uh, we will both be in Vegas at um, I, <laughs> at the, uh, I, I don't think it's, I'm trying to remember, I think it's the Peptide Congress. It's the SSRP, Dr. Seed's Peptide Congress, uh, September 10th and 11th. So if any of you guys happen to be there, then we'll be somewhere floating come around with us. our flags come, come find, find us. us. I'm bringing my camera. We're going to take pictures with all the esteemed doctors and colleagues of Natalie. Natalie's going to speak on peptides. We might be wearing leather pants and our flex beams at the same Maybe. time. Maybe. Yeah, sure. we haven't quite decided yet. And actually in the show notes, there will be, um, there, I have a discount code for that conference. So if anybody's interested, I'll put that into the show notes. I didn't look it up before we recorded, so I don't have it with me, so I can't share it here. Um, but yeah, look us up and you can also check that event out virtually if you want. But most importantly, what you want to do is follow this woman uh, wherever you can, because she's just a fountain of fabulousness and information. So thank you so much, Kristen, for being here today. Okay, I love you. I can't wait to see you soon. Likewise. Bye. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be heard and to be seen. If you'd like to connect with me directly, or if you'd like to leave any comments, or if you have any questions about this episode, please reach out to me directly through my website, natnidham.com. And of course, if you're not already a member of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Community on Facebook, that's where you'll find me every day. It's a short application. Just answer a couple of questions and you're in and interfacing with other amazing biohackers. Thanks again. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.